Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It is an awesome, awesome autumn day today. And uh, this last week as I was traveling, I, I drove through the uh, Smoky Mountains. I drew, drove through the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains and everything. And as you get all the way up in the upper uh, heights of the mountains up in there, up in the, uh, the leaves are starting to turn color. And it was really kind of cool. It was, it was that change of seasons and, and that opportunity for us to, to look at things differently again. And, and so uh, it sparks that uh, new beginning as we come into fall season and, and preparing ourselves for winter and things like that. It gives us that opportunity for a different take of a different season of life. And I think that's pretty neat. So as we come into fall here, we've got a lot of neat things here going on. October 9th is going to be another Orange Track Racing, and it'll be the second to the last one of the year. Can't believe that November is the end of the racing season for the year. And coming up after that, in November, it's going to be movie time again. So we're going to have a movie night. November 20th, we will be having movie night, and we are going to have the movie The Christmas Angel. So we just decided on that one this morning here, and, and uh, so kind of excited about that. Uh, we're going to be starting up our Advent study coming online accordingly uh, when the Advent season comes in. And we're also starting to talk about what we want to do for a holiday, whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or both, uh, project out here like we did uh, last year. And I thought that was awesome that we got together and, and did something for the community. So we kind of want to kick around some ideas. So we'll be thinking about that. And we'll get together and discuss those things. So lots of lots of good things in store. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Awesome, awesome. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we, this morning? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you that you promised us that where there two or more are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate your gifts of freedom and the gift of life that you've lavished on each one of us. As we begin this new week, we ask for your guidance, for your direction, for your peace, your hope, and your joy to come upon us. Lord, most of all, we ask for your spirit to dwell within us and for your love to surround us. We lift up those who couldn't be with us here today and we pray your blessing upon them. We pray for those who are sick or injured or unable to help themselves. We lift them up to you today and we ask them ask you to give them the healing that they need and that they be blessed today and that they feel that blessing and know that you are near. For us in attendance today, we ask that you would open our ears so that we might hear your voice, our minds, so that we might receive your eternal wisdom. We ask that you would open our spirits that we might know your leading and your guidance and open our hearts that we might receive your wonderful love. We ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry who brings us the word today in the message that he's prepared for us. Thank you, Lord, for putting that upon his heart and for bringing that message to us today. We thank you for the gifts of your grace, your mercy, your peace, and your love. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark.
This morning comes from 1 John 4, 4 through 6, and it's found in the New Living Translation. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world. So they speak from this world's viewpoint. And the world listens to them. But we belong to God. And those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That's how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Boy, how true those words ring today, don't they? So it's, it's, you know, if you look around you today, and, and we said this a couple of weeks ago, and we'll probably say it many, many more times again, but if we look around at the world around us, it's really easy to be frightened by all that wickedness that is around us, and we seem to become overwhelmed by all the problems that we face. And coming into this uh, season here, this next month in October, uh, you know, 
this wickedness around us takes form. And, you know, people prepare for Halloween. And you, as I was driving along down through the, uh, from the East Coast out from Raleigh on out, I saw all of these horror, uh, blood and gore uh, billboards that were up alongside the road and, and all these different things celebrating, you know, the All Hallows Eve. And, and uh, you know, there's more people, I think, that, that get into that spirit and unfortunately, the spirit then gets into them unwittingly. And evil is obviously much stronger than we are by ourselves. By ourselves. But in this passage in John here, it, it assures us that God is even stronger. He will conquer all evil and his spirit and his world will live in our hearts. And that's why we need to guard our hearts from the influences of this world, from the false teachings and the pressure to conform to that societal norm or AKA political correctness that's out there. Our hearts are the gateways to our soul and our, they are our holy of holies. And the false teachers are popular with this world because like the false prophets that we had in the Old Testament times, they tell people what they want to hear. And the people buy into that. John warns us that Christians who faithfully teach the word of God will not win any popularity contests in this world. And I think we know that <laughs> if we, uh, you know, if we share our opinion on things, well, you know, that's just you guys. You guys are Bible thumpers and everything else. Well, but the thing about it is, you know, we're speaking the truth. And sometimes people don't want to hear the truth. Amen, brother. People don't want to hear their sins denounced to them. A false teacher will be well received by non-Christians because they tell them what they want to hear. They water down the gospel message and spin it just enough to make it fit that popular agenda and to engage them into do as I say, not as I do behaviors. See, and that's in order to fit in with the crowd in today's society. But see, that goes against the very teachings that they purport to believe in at the same time. So if they don't listen to your warnings or corrections, then you know that they are not of God. So I'm very excited as we uh, get to hear Pastor Terry's message this morning here about fitting in and see what kind of, of message and direction that God has put on his heart. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, bless Pastor Terry and just fill him full of your spirit right now so that it just overflows into our hearts, into our ears, into our mind, into our very lives. Thank you, Lord. Help us to think about our lives. Help us to think about where we are in our process of our lives, in our journey. And if we're following you and if we're going to be with you in heaven or if we're headed for someplace a lot more. Lord, we just ask for your blessing upon us today, and we ask that you would open our hearts and our ears to hear your message, to receive your message, and to live it out daily. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Not Florida. Not Florida. Thank you, Lord. This message is one that's been kind of sitting on my heart for a while now because we, we all try to fit into something. Especially out in the world because whether, you know, uh, it's at work or in, in our friend groups or what have you, and it, there's all types of, or all times in our lives where we've tried to fit in. I don't know, I was thinking back to when I was three. I have memories of that. And I actually found, I remember with my dad's yesterday, I found a postcard set and that the pool that I nearly drowned in, I finally got to show Diane a picture of that pool. And it was exactly as I remembered it. And so there, we do have that ability to remember those memories. And one of the memories that I remember that fits into this fitting in sermon today is when I was three, I went to preschool. And in that preschool, it was a home-based preschool, but there was a room, and there were, uh, and it was all 
and you know, it seemed like it was big because, you know, for me, I was like, it was right up to here and I could reach everything. But there were places for sinks and there was, um, before its time, a table sandbox for indoors. And we would play and we got along and the kids, we didn't have any preconceived notions and nothing had gotten into our heads to change how we should feel about one another. But then, by the time I got to about first, second grade in school, the cliques started to appear. Peer groups started to, and as we got older, they would solidify. And it was so horrible because I always wanted to fit in. I was, I was that, you know, guy that was off to the side and never really fit into those groups. And those peer groups, they changed from time to time based on one thing or another. Maybe somebody moved into town or somebody moved out. But in a small town like that I grew up in, uh, by the time you hit high school graduation, you're like, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm going. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. And I had a feeling, even at that point when I got out of there and I went to college and I went to start to do other things that didn't really fit in. And I wasn't willing to sacrifice some of the things I believed in to fit in. And so I think back to uh, the first sentence of the call to worship this morning that, that Pastor Mark read. It, John tells us that we belong to God. So we, we do fit in. We belong to something so much bigger than anything that we've tried to fit into in the world. You know, we can come to church and we fit in. Now there are churches that you will go to that there are cliques. And you will feel like you don't fit in. But when it comes right down to it, when it, when it we're looking at scripture and we're looking at what God is telling us. We belong to something bigger. And the problem with not feeling like we fit in is that Satan has invaded this world. We talked about that just a moment ago. And he wants us to feel like we don't belong, like we don't fit in anywhere. That's, I mean, that's part of his goal of tearing us down. And if he can get us to do those doubts, then he's got more and more control, more and more handle on what we're doing, but this is so important that John reiterates it again two verses later in verse 6 when he says that we belong to God. It's that important. It's repeated. So the first section of this chapter was about discerning false prophets, those who would lead us astray. Turn on the TV, pick up a magazine, pick up the newspaper, turn on the radio, step outside and look at a billboard, talk to somebody on the street. All of it. People, we live in a fallen world. So we are, Satan is constantly, through false prophets, trying to lead us astray. Yet John gives us some really solid advice about determining those who belong to him and those who do not. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them up to toward almost the end. Not much left there. Let's look up, let's look at Chapter 4, 1 John, and we're going to kind of go through verses 7 through 21. Um, and that's really going to take us all the way through the rest of that chapter. And in these first couple of verses, this is what he writes. He says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So love comes from God. We belong to God. We therefore are the recipients of his love. We see it firsthand. Where the world may see it, but they don't recognize it. And this makes so much sense because God created everything. I mean, you can go back, we can go all the way back to the first part of the book. And look at the very first verse where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. Everything is of God. So, some would read this and, and 
they would think, you know, if everyone just loved everyone else, we would live in such a wonderful world. Wouldn't it? And in the back of my mind as I'm writing that statement, all I hear is, is Louis Armstrong in the back of my head going, and I think to myself, <laughs> It's like, oh wow, what a wonderful world we live in if everything. But then, and if we go even just a, a little bit further into the, that first book, sin enters the world. And that wonderful world, mm, it's gone. It's gone. Everybody wants, everybody wants to blame me. Adam was standing there right next to him and kept his mouth shut. So they're both complicit in this. So don't let anybody tell you differently. It was, a, it was an equal partnership. She just happened to be the one to chat with, with Satan there. But if we lived in that wonderful world, we, we would have no fighting. Everyone would just get along. Just everybody get along. Some, there's something else there. <laughs> but everybody isn't going to get along. And it's not going to happen before Jesus comes back. It's the type of world we live in. I mean, I love my family, and I know they love me, but I also know that I can get on their nerves. No. Not just a bit, <laughs> all lot. And it happens. And you know what? That's part of life. The author Erica Young once said, love is everything it's cracked up to be. That's why people are so cynical about it. It really is worth fighting for, risking everything. And the trouble is, if you don't risk everything, you risk even more. And if we put that in the context of the scriptures, God is love. And we risk everything for God. And before service, we were talking, the uh, fourth installment of the God's Not Dead series is coming out. It's going to be in theater, theaters for three days. Uh, the fourth, fifth, and sixth, so on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And it is playing at, Mar at the Marcus Theater over on the other side of town. So if you get the opportunity, it's at 7 o'clock, go see it. They are going to be talking about, and they're taking a big step because they're going into homeschooling and how um, the government in this particular uh, movie is coming in and telling them what they can and cannot do with that homeschooling and threatening to take and jail the parents. And it comes down to their faith. But they are willing to risk everything. What are you willing to risk? Think about that. What are you willing to risk for God? Saying that love is worth risking everything is like saying that God is worth risking everything for. And he is worth the risk. He is worth the if you do not have love, you do not have God. This is what John tells us in verse 8. He says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And if they don't know God, they don't truly know what love is. They have a world's definition of love. And the world's definition of love has a tendency to swing over towards lust. It's not real love. Love gets thrown out there quite a bit, doesn't it? That word is overly used for things it doesn't really mean. Now, I know that all of you, or most of you, have sung the song, and, and the verse goes like this, and they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they will know we are Christians by our love. It is love that sets us apart from the rest of the world. And that's kind of, you know, I got these little people up here on the screen here, and I'm thinking, we're set apart. we fit in. So we can almost flip the script and say, this is the world, and that's God's people. We are held to something different. Now, because there are, are many people who are not Christians in this world, They have a tendency to look at us because we don't hold up to what we say we stand for. And 
I, to be honest with you, I know several Christian, or non-Christians that behave better and more Christ-like than Christians. And honestly, they've got a good point when they say, well, if you're a Christian, why do you act like that? Why do you do that? Well, number one, I'm sinful. I'm not perfect. As a Christian, that's, I mean, that's the world we live in. We're going to make mistakes. The difference is, is that we come back to God, we repent, and we work to let the Holy Spirit change us as we move forward. Now, some of the things that they see and do not like about Christians is, is people who tell rumors about friends and family. If you love someone, why would you want to hurt them by telling rumors about them? I have even gone so far as to, I've seen pastors talk about their former congregations in a poor light through gossip. We're not, none is, we all fall short. Instead of talking about somebody, talk to the person who that rumor is about. Talk to them and tell them. And, don't go to everyone else. Go to the source. Find out what's going on. Maybe they need us. Maybe they need our help. But don't continue to spread that rumor. And I'm sorry, I've got better things to do in my life than to destroy somebody else's by talking about them behind their back. Now, there was a senator, his name was Hatfield. He, recalled, um, he was recalled as uh, a singing, a suffering, a praying, Actually, I'm, Senator Hatfield was actually talking about Dr. Halverson. Dr. Halverson was a uh, chaplain in Washington, D.C. Senator Hatfield recalled him as a singing, a suffering, a praying, a preaching, and a comforting and compassionate presence in the U.S. Senate. At Dr. Halverson's memorial service, Reverend Dr. Billy Graham reflected, saying, Two words that I have heard over and over again tonight sum up Dr. Halverson's life. One is prayer, and the other is love. The non-Christians not like is when Christians condemn others or judge others for the way that they live, act, or dress. We as Christians need to hold each other up and go to each other when things aren't what we think they should be. Because my brothers, my, my fellow pastors here at Grace Street, if, if we aren't doing what we say we're going to do, we hold each other accountable. If something's going on in our lives, we go to them for counsel to help get through that. Oftentimes, in addition to that, we tend to judge someone by the way they look. Now I was, and I think I've told you guys this before, I was threatened to go into my old church, dyed hair, black dress, black top to bottom, and cigarette hanging out of my mouth. I couldn't be lit because, you know, I quit almost 20 years ago. Can't, couldn't do that. But just to see how they would react. Because I wanted to see how people would treat other people who don't look like them. And too often, what do we do? The first thing we say is, they have piercings. Oh, they have tattoos. I don't like the way they're dressed. I don't like the way they have their hair cut. They need a haircut. That's awful. Get a haircut. <laughs> Pull up your pants. <laughs> we do those things. But God has called us to love them. Now, Abigail Van Buren, you know her as Dear Abby. She once said that she said the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. It's been said many different ways, but that's how she put it. And when you think about that, this is where people come for a safe space, a place where they can come and be nourished by the scriptures to grow and to look for that change. I heard somebody once say, time say, well, it shouldn't be a, a 
hospital for sinners because once they come in, then they're they're well again. Well, sinful world, no. I think we we got to keep coming back. We need to keep sharpening one another. It just keeps going around and around in a vicious circle. Now, I had talked several years ago with a, a staff member of Youth for Christ about teenagers in the church, and a lot of the teens he works with don't know Christ. And I used to, I used to have the opportunity to go to Kennedy for the breakfast club, and I would sat with a table of five guys. They didn't know Jesus. They didn't know who I was, what I did, and they were, they liked to just use cultural language. That was part of their daily vernacular. That's how they talked. Until one day they said, so tell me about him. What, what does he do? I said, oh, he's kind of like a youth pastor to the, to the city. <laughs> he was Bob Dye was the director of Youth for Christ at the time. And then they decided to ask me what I did. At the time, I was a full-time youth pastor. And all of a sudden, they got real quiet and kind of ashen paced. He's like, I don't know. I said, guys, Number one, you don't necessarily believe the way that I believe, so I'm not asking you to change. I am asking you to listen. And over the course of six months, that conversation changed. Those four-letter bombs that they would drop just casually slowly disappeared. And it wasn't an effort. It just dropped out of their, out of their language. But Bob and then... Uh, subsequent directors and, and the people that worked with them, they would try to get these kids to go to church. And they would have some success. But then we go back to those questions I mentioned earlier. The people would look at them and go, what are you doing here? Why are you dressed like that? And that comment I made earlier, get a haircut? Yeah, that came out. Those kids were not, they didn't feel loved. And it's even worse when the non-Christians see us looking at our family and treating our families without that same love. You say you love your family. Show it. How do you show that love? It's so easy to say those words. I talked about that earlier. It's love is water now. It's so easy to say those words, but it's so hard to show that. And for some, it's hard because they've never seen that model. When I was a kid, my mom called me the huggiest kid she'd ever met. I would hug it. I still hug every day. <laughs> Even with, well, at first with COVID, and, you know, you've got to be a little careful, maybe a side hug. Mm -hmm. But she was, I was the huggiest kid she knew. And when we were driving, and I was, you know, I would wave at everybody. <laughs> Sitting in the back seat, I would wave. And this is back before we had to worry about car seats or seat belts, because played in the back seat. I waved at everybody. And then I waved at a, a policeman once. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Don't draw attention to dad. He's speeding. <laughs> but I was waving at everybody. The problem is, and I hear this so much now, is that everybody is looked at in a poor light. We judge everyone ahead of time. Policemen are being judged just because they put on a badge. They're there to protect us. Not just arrest people or write tickets or worse. Yeah, there's a few bad apples, but what a horrible thing to tell a child. To point out different groups of people and say, you shouldn't like them, you shouldn't like them, you shouldn't like them, based on what they look like, how they dress, what they do for work. We cannot be doing that. Now, honestly, I still wave at them. I think I catch them off guard because they, they get that surprised look on their face like, well, why, why, they, why is he waving at me? But contrary to popular uh, thought, it's not going to make them wonder what I'm up to. Or could, depending on what the world's done to them. But I still wave at them. Going back to Dr. Halverson, he was uh, the chaplain of the DSN, he said this, there's nothing you can do to make God 
love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. His love is unconditional, impartial, everlasting, infinite, and perfect. If only we could love the way that God loves us. The doctor, Dr. Halverson would walk through the halls of the Capitol and he knew everyone by name. He cared. It didn't matter whether you were operating an elevator, whether you were the janitor, he cared about you. Do you know the people that you work with, the people that in your life are in your life? Now, there's so many things that go on. I feel fortunate that here at Grace Street we've become that type of church where you're welcome regardless of all those things. You're welcome regardless of all those things. Our church is a family that takes in others and shows them Christ's love. We saw that when we had our movie. We had some guests and they felt welcome. They, and they weren't smothered. We don't, we don't smother you. Come join us. We won't smother you. But we will love on you. And that's the important part. We show the love that people need to have. Unfortunately, there are too many churches out there that are not accepting like this. And you know, they could almost be accused of neglecting God's children. Now, if we put that in the context of the world, what happens? This is a strictly just a question. Nobody has to answer this. But think about this. What happens to people who are accused of child neglect? What happens? So if we're neglecting God's children, just let that sit in your minds for a moment. John continues, he says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us. And his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. And then he says, God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. In verses 10 and 14, John tells us that God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to take away our sins. It goes right back to John 3.16, might be the most prolific and well-known verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now if we jump to Romans, it kind of takes this and, and puts it all together. So Romans 5 verses 1 through 8 says this, Therefore since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace. We've talked about peace in the past. The peace that God gives us. With God because of what Jesus our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they have helped us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. 
look to the world and they're trying to fit in. That leads to disappointment, but not through God. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love when we were utterly helpless. Utterly helpless. Christ came at the, just the right time and died for us sinners. And now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This ties right back into verses 17 through 18 of, of this passage in John, 1 John that we're in, where he says, and As we live in God, our love grows more perfect, so we will not be afraid of the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus in this world. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. Now, I don't know about you, but when my brother was just a, just a little guy, he would get in trouble, or he would do something wrong, I would take the blame for him, because I hated seeing him getting punished. I really hated that. But, um, yeah, then the punishments started coming more often and a little more severe. He had to learn a lesson. <laughs> I had to take the blame for it. But here's the thing Jesus didn't do that to us. He didn't say, Your sin is too great. What you've done is, is horrible. I can't, we can't possibly do anything about that. If Jesus had called on that army of angels to save him while we, he was being punished for our sins, we would be out of luck. There is no way, if that had happened, for us to have gotten to heaven. There's no way you can't earn your way in. Sin separates us from God. We would be up the proverbial creek without a path. We would not have been able to save ourselves. But because of God's love and sacrifice, we don't have to fear that separation from Him because of our sin. Now, if we look at this a little bit differently, is this us in the world, and, but that's God's children? It reminds me of Isaiah 118. It says, Come, now let's settle this, says the Lord. Through, though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. When we come into that fold, when we fit into God's family, we are cleansed. We are made whole again. In this verse, God is inviting us to talk to Him, to confess those sins to Him, to change our lives. God gave us an instruction manual. Now, I know, guys, we don't like to read instructions or put something together. This is an instruction manual we need. We all have Bibles laying around. I can probably tell you I probably have maybe seven Bibles upstairs and then maybe ten downstairs and you know on the bookshelf. And then you know, get out your phone, get out your tablet, get on your computer, you got access to how many different versions of the Bible. Here's the thing. We have that luxury. But one in five people in the world are waiting for the Bible to be translated into their language. There's 7,360 7, languages spoken in the world. 704 have a full Bible translation. 1,551 have a complete New Testament. 2,731 are currently being translated, languages that are being translated. That's as of October of last year, a year ago. But here in the United States, one of these things, one of these Bibles, every three seconds, one is sold. Every three seconds. That's 190 a minute, 11,415 an hour, over a quarter of a million per day. God has made sure that we have no excuse not to know Him. 
not to know his word. So let's look at the last few verses. It says, we love each other because he loved us first. Well, he loved us so much, he gave us a lot of Bibles. We have lots of access. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. I'm just going to call you out. You say you love someone, but do not love them and show that then you are a liar. For if we don't love people, we can see how can we love God whom we cannot see. And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Our brothers and sisters are also our neighbors. And that goes back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. That's a whole other sermon that has been preached on a few times. Um, but Jesus tells us that everyone is our neighbor in that parable. And this takes me right back to those three points that non-Christians do not like about Christians. They don't. So we have to remember to not do these things. Don't spread rumors. Don't say that you love and then not show it. And don't judge and condemn one another. As Christians, when they're looking at this, they're thinking of people condemning them for what they're doing. If I haven't earned the right to speak into your life, I certainly shouldn't be talk, telling you what you're... Because, Mark, you have permission to speak in my life. Bruce also has that permission. My wife has that permission and uses it. <laughs> it's important as Christians that we hold each other accountable, but we do it truth in love. Not truth in hate. Because that's what we see in the world, and that's what non-Christians see us doing. They see us judging and condemning them for what they are, who they are, how they act, what they believe. We can't judge the world because they don't live by the same belief system. We can do is we can go out and love them and pray through prayer. Let's go back to our three attendants of this ministry. Prayer, praying for them, praying for opportunities, then taking the opportunity to care for them. And earning, not standing on a street corner on a bulwark, earning the right to speak into their life. That's what they don't see. If we do not love each other, we cannot love God. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 says, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important, love your neighbors yourself. This sounds really easy, doesn't it? But it's not. Love everyone the way that God loves you. It's not easy. But we need to do it. Once you've made the decision to accept Christ, dig into this instruction manual and learn not a, just about coming to church on Sunday. It's not just about going to a Bible study whenever you go here. It's Wednesday nights. It's about digging into the Word on a daily basis and studying the Word. Even if you get in here and you, all right, I'm going to read this plan and I read one chapter and one verse and that one verse just, I get stuck. Take the time to, God has put that on my mind. I'm going to take the time. I'm going to dig that apart learn about it. So I want to know because I want to fit into this family. I want to fit into this family. And while we don't necessarily fit into this world, yeah, we don't fit into that world. That world isn't for us. We're sojourning here. We're traveling through here on our way to eternity. We don't fit into this world. But because of God, we fit into his family. Stand out in the world being new. Father God, thank you that we are part of your family. Thank you that you have done so much for us and given us so many opportunities, and each day is a new one, a new opportunity, a new day to show your love even more to those around us. Father, we don't need to fit into this world. But we do need to stand out. We need to stand out in a way that shows your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into this time of communion today, I'd like us to kind of just pause for a moment. And I'd like you to repeat after me. I'd like you to take a look at the cross up here on the wall. 
and repeat after me. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Because of Jesus' love, I have eternal life. Because of Jesus' love, I have eternal life. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, I am clean. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, I am clean. Amen. Amen. So what we just talked about in here is, is exactly why we come to communion together. To be reminded that Jesus died for our sins. He set us apart from sin and death. Because of his love, because of his sacrifice on the cross, we have eternal life. We have been given gifts. We call those blessings from God. This is God's ultimate gift to us, is Jesus' death on the cross. But moreover, he cleansed us. We are clean of our sins. We're clean of our past. We're clean of all the old junk. It's up to us to, number one, receive that gift from God. It's up to us to let the old junk go. Don't drag it along with us. We demean the gift of God when we bring up all the junk from the past and drag it along. So as we take communion today, I want you to lift up at the cross. And I want you to think about that, that Jesus died on the cross to save us of those sins. Jesus' love, God's love is everlasting through all the ages. It never gives up. It never goes away. And because of that, God's love and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, none of the old junk comes with us. The sins are gone. We're made clean. We're a new, new, new beginning. We're a new individual. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he showed the disciples and he said, Take and eat. This is my body broken. Likewise, later on in the meal, he took the cup, and after he filled it, he blessed the cup, and he said, Take and drink. This is my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is the new covenant between you and God. Take and drink. And each time that we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are reminded of that sacrifice that Jesus made. For us, for us, you and I. So for the, those of you who are online, if you need communion supplies, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to get them out to you. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God.
went out of his way and he said, I just want to thank you for everything you've done for us. And the look Aww. on his face was like, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. it was so neat. So he was showing his love to people. That, that is a godsend. Yeah. Because the police need to know that we care about them and that we love them too. Yeah. Because they're doing it for us a great service. And they don't get thanked very often, I'm sure. And in this world that we have today, it's it's kind of a, a scary place for them to yeah. be. So that is a God sighting. Anybody else? And no? Bruce, what's your boss's name? Adam. Adam, okay. I wanna pray for him this morning too. Um, we had a, a God sighting yesterday and uh, Steve and I, was we were at Menards just shopping. And uh, we walked past this little old man and he stopped us and he said, do you have a DVD player? And uh, we said, yeah, we do. And uh, he said, well, he wanted to hand us this DVD, which is all about Christ, Christ, um, um, just his whole life, basically. And it's in eight languages. And he said that he's 93 years old, travels here from Tipton once in a while. And just, um, he said, he's never, you know, we're never too old to do something for Jesus. And that just resonated with my heart. And um, it just, um, it just, I don't know, it just touched me because we're never too old to do something for God. And uh, it just gave me hope. And um, so I just thank God for that man. And then when we went to, uh, when we were at the, the register, I turned around and there he was again. And he asked me the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you gave us one, so we will, we will look at it. So um, it was just an amazing thing. You know, he was 93 years old, and he drove all the way from Tipton. And I thought that was an amazing event, too. <laughs> so, Possibly yeah. <laughs> yes, but, you know, it's almost like an angel among us, you know, that we just didn't, didn't expect. So anyway, um, so this morning we'll just... Uh, Go to prayer. Father God, we call on you this morning, and I would like to thank you for the lives of the following people that we are praying for this morning. Bruce's boss, Adam, Carla and Bill, Steve, Larry, and Jen. And I ask that you work a miracle in their lives today and breathe into them the breath of life, that they may be healed from their illness according to your will, and they may awaken to the knowledge of you. For you are the comforter, the counselor, and the Holy Spirit. Please help every one of us today who are listening to know that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through you, Jesus Christ. Psalms 91, 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shadow of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So, Father God, we thank you that you put people in our paths to witness to us when we need it the most. You are a great God and so worthy of praise. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you very much.
praying to come together and worship Jesus. I can't tell you how it fills my heart each week to be here with all of you, my my dear family in Christ. And, and if you're watching online, we absolutely include you in our family. And uh, we pray for a day when maybe we can all be together, but we certainly understand with the way the world is, the way COVID is, the way sometimes we wake up and we don't feel real well. And then you wonder, you know, what is it? Is it cold? Whatever it is, I don't want to give it to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, so when you're not here, though, part of us is, is missing. And when you're with us online, you're with us online. And we are all in Christ together. Amen. Worthy is the love, Lamb who was saved.
loves you personally. Regardless of any of the junk in your life, anything that you've gone through, God loves you that much. He is the reason we fit into God's family. John ends this first letter by saying, and we know that the Son of God has come, and He has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the one and only true God. He is eternal life. No matter how you've ever been made to feel in this world, know that God has something bigger and better for you. There's a hope that we have because of that. Reach out to your Father in heaven. Let him know that you desire to have a relationship. And when you do, just ask him in your heart. And then the Holy Spirit will take over. Allow the Holy Spirit to move you and shape you so that you can truly love as Jesus loved, as God loves us. Father, we thank you for your many blessings in our life and what you give us. We thank you for this church, for the people here, the people online, for the love that they have for one another because of what you have shown us. Let us take that out into this upcoming day and week, months, and years. Share your love with everyone. In Jesus' name.